All right, we, uh, we... Oh. Good with time. Good, serves you right. Not with your teeth. Sharpen your pens with uh, We've been going through this whole business last week or two, and by the way, there's only two weeks left. Two weeks. It's going to go very quickly. Because I said just a little while ago, there was five weeks left, and now there isn't. So, anyway, we've been doing this whole business that uh, for everything we do linearly, we've got an exact analog rotationally. And all we have to do is substitute the variables and use the very same equations. And that uh, held for several things, especially uh, when we got this idea of, uh, of uh, linear inertia, which is what mass is. It's not... It's, it's a measure of how hard it is to get something moving when we push on it. Then we had um, moment of inertia did the same thing for that. Then uh, uh, I think we just got our rotational equivalent of F equals MA on, uh, on uh, last week, on Wednesday. I, I think we just got into that. Maybe I actually gotten to the day before. Um, so that the right hand side is easy to do. Wherever there's an M, put an I. Wherever there's an A, put an alpha. So we had that business there. Uh, what was it, though, that it makes objects accelerate in a rotational way at a certain speed? If I have some object here and I want it to accelerate at some rotational speed, some rotational acceleration, given that it has some moment of inertia, which is, that's what I gotta get accelerating, is that moment of inertia. What is it that took it to, to do that? How could I get something rotating that wasn't before? That was torque, remember our symbol for it? Half pi. Tau. Yeah, half pi. Tau. Half pi. And there can be more than one of those torques, so we have to sum them up. Uh, what was torque, though? Remember what, a, what torque is? It's a force applied at some distance. That distance we call the moment arm. So I could apply a force here the moment arm is the smallest perpendicular distance to the point of rotation. I could apply the force at some greater place. It have a greater D and therefore a greater torque. Well, you kind of know all this business anyway. This, this is, this is. You have some experience with this. You could go out and do this with your car this afternoon. If you take your car and hold your hands very near the inside of it, it's hard to, it's hard to control it much because the D is so small. You need a big force, and you're you're uh, adjusting things all the time. You don't have as much control. If you move your hands out farther then things are a lot easier to control. You don't need as much force. You can feel those very, very same things uh, with torque. A lot of you uh, have ever tried to, to uh, get a, a, a very sticky nut loose with a, uh, with a wrench, and you may realize, you know, if I've got a nut here and a wrench on it, And I push on that wrench, and it doesn't come loose, what's one of the things you can do? Do what? Kick it. Well, you, yeah, you kick it, you put a greater force on it, might not work, that thing goes flying off, hits you in the nose. You can put a, a pipe on there. Put a pipe, this is an old trick, put a pipe on there. Now you can get a much greater moment arm 
you can apply less force, or if you apply the same amount of force, you get so much more moment arm, you get a lot more torque, and then maybe it's enough to break the, uh, break the uh, nut free. Uh, and that's why when there's really big nuts to move, you get really big wrenches, because they're gonna need a lot of force to make those move. It's, a, it's nothing more than torque being a force at a particular distance. Each one of these, remember, is when the force is perpendicular to the moment arm. All right, so we had that. Oh, we even had the, we had kinetic energy in here. So we could find the kinetic energy of something rotating. We had that in there. There's some other things we didn't get to yet. Um, one would be, uh, well, do you remember the impulse momentum equation? Yeah or no? Never heard it before? Some people are not and some people are shaking their head. I'm talking to the same class. We had, uh, we had this equation. Um, I'll put it in, in our usual constant force. Oh, you said it. Well, you sort of said it. Not, not quite right. Uh, we've done this before. Force times the amount of time that force is applied. Didn't we do that? That's impulse. Actually, the sum of the impulses, because we could have more than one force. Um, that's going to cause the momentum to change. And that's, uh, that's almost uh, there what Samantha gave me. Remember, it's a vector equation because momentum itself is a vector. You might suspect that that uh, there's some equivalent of linear momentum. If we have an equivalent of angular momentum, oops, this isn't right. The M is in the P there, so uh, you would you were going to catch that, weren't you? Well, I guess you weren't going to catch it. Uh, you'd suspect that we have some um, rotational equivalent of momentum. If we have mass, we put in moment of inertia. If we have velocity, we put in angular velocity. So what we've got here is some object with a certain moment of inertia rotating at a certain speed. That seems like uh, uh, something that would have angular momentum. Because if we want to stop that thing from spinning, we're going to have to reach in with a certain force, apply that certain force for a certain amount of time to get it to stop rotating or to speed it up if we need to, whatever it is we need to do with it. So this indeed is angular momentum. We just need a symbol for it. Anybody got a recommendation of a good symbol for angular momentum? Yeah, yeah I agree. Capital L. <laughs> makes sense. That makes sense, I think. You guys are good soldiers. You just write it down. You know. Alan, and we're going to work with this one a little bit today. How come nothing on the rotational side has a vector symbol? Uh, because everything we have rotates in one plane. So it's either going clockwise or counterclockwise or plus or minus. And that's what we weren't doing it anymore with that. But in full 3D, yeah, it is a vector. And both, like mass has no vector, but all those have vectors, so yeah, it, 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 it actually would be a, a full vector equation. 
so we have angular momentum. Uh, so you think we have impulse and momentum equation, and we do. Some of the torques apply for a certain amount of time. So if we've got a force we're applying such that it twists something, the longer we apply that twisting force, the torque, the greater the change in speed will be. I guess that makes a pretty good sense. And we assume the mass and moment of inertia in our problems are, are constant. Well, let's see. We've, uh, we've worked with that impulse momentum one before. So I'm just going to put it up so we can remind ourselves. Now we've got an angular equivalent to it. And I'll leave that one off without the vectors. And we'll just assume that it only rotates counterclockwise or clockwise. Uh, so it's not really a, a full three-dimensional vector thing. Um, we did a lot of work with this equation <coughs> in collisions, didn't we? The, uh, the external forces were zero. Therefore, the impulse was zero. Then they want that side zero, then that side zero. Remember doing uh, some work with that? That was all of our collisions were, were governed by that equation. And it was called, that, that situation is called conservation of momentum. You might suspect then if there are either no outside torques or whatever torques there are counterbalance each other. That's the kind of thing that you're trying to twist thing one way and I'm trying to twist it the other way by the same amount so it doesn't actually move. That would be that situation. Or it doesn't actually accelerate. Then Then delta L equals zero. Remember where L is this angular momentum. All right, let's, uh, let's, we're gonna do a couple things. Well, we're gonna do one thing and then come back to that. First, let's get this idea of, uh, of moment of inertia in, in our brain, just so we've got it. I'm gonna uh, take a little, very simple situation. I've got two objects here, both exactly the same. A meter stick with two masses at each end, both the exact same masses. Not exact, but sort of exact, same masses. So one looks like that. One is the exact same things. Only in different places. Call that one number one, call that one number two. I have three questions for three possibilities you pick. I a I one is greater than I two. I one is equal to I two. I one is less than I two. Those three possibilities. That can't be more than any one of them. So there's only one of those you can vote for. You take a second. Decide which one of those you like. Okay. 
B, C, and then think if there's some way we could prove which is which. Because we're only one of these is true, but we also have to prove which is true. So think about it uh, for maybe 30 seconds on which one of those you want to vote for. And remember, physics is not a democracy. Look at it. Does something have to rotate to have a moment of inertia? However, if you remember from our moment of inertia table, the moment of inertia has to be with respect to a certain axis about which the things might rotate, but they don't necessarily have to. So we'll keep it simple, right down the center. So there's your axis of rotation, right down the center. Which one has the greater, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rotate that way. Which one has the greater moment of inertia? In fact, if, if you want, if this would help, this uh, distance is is 10 centimeters and for the bigger one it's 45. one has the greater moment of inertia. You've got 15 more seconds to decide, then you need to commit. And this is not a presidential election that you can just sit out. This is important, so you have to vote. Yeah. So I need to pass out bumper stickers, pins, and we need to get some robocalls going in the middle of dinner. Hi, this is moment of inertia. I'm running for Congress. Ready? Everybody who thinks A is true, raise your hand and don't look around. I'll make you put your head down for a secret ballot if I need to. One, two. Oh, God, now i got to start over. One, two, three, four, five, six, six. Who thinks the second one is true? One brave soul. John, you haven't voted yet. You've got the vote. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people. That means three people think this. Which would be John, Andrew, Tyler. I got three here. No, your 15 seconds was up. You can't start anything. You, you know, it's on election day, you can't walk in there and say, I'm still thinking, can I come back tomorrow and vote? They say, no, you vote now. Uh, well, let's see. What is moment of inertia? How do we, how do we find it for an object like this? It's an object made up of two things. First thing you do is you look in that little table and see, gosh, is, is, it, uh, is, it right, is this object right there in the table? Is it? Remember table 12.3 on page 382? Is it there? This object is? What do you mean something like it? There's nothing like it. It's kind of like a dumbbell. Is that in the table? Which one? Count down. Show me which one. No. Oh, thought I smelled something burning. This object isn't in there. Remember, though, uh, how we find the moment of inertia of an object that's made up of compound pieces. This is made up of three different pieces. 
of the inertia. If we want to know the moment of inertia of something made up of pieces, we just add all the inertias up individually. All right, so this first one here, uh, I1, is made up of a long, slender bar rotated about its center. Is that in the table? It sure is. That is there. That's 1 12th ml squared. So we'll say 1 12th uh, mass of the stick L squared. I don't know the mass of the stick. Um, I certainly know its length. It's a meter stick. Is that, do I have the right L? Yeah, L's the whole length, not the, not the half length. How do I figure out the moment of inertia contribution of these things? At least get an estimate. How could I do that? Well, let's just treat them as as very small masses, meaning their di their size is much smaller than the distance they are from the axis. So it's just simply then, let's see, the mass of the block times the square of the distance they are from the axis. And that's L over 2. That's nothing more than MR squared for very small mass. Uh, by small, I mean its size is quite a bit smaller than the R we're talking about. It's certainly R squared. Oh, uh, there's two of them. What do we do? Well, we're adding them up. There's two of them. We just do it twice. So we got that little bit. Let's see, we can, we can simplify this a bit. Mass of the stick over 12 plus 2 over 4. So mass of a block over 2 times L squared. Is that right? No, it's not. Just algebra. I, I, I took the L squared out, and that was it. Why is the mass of the over 2, though? Because this is L over 2 squared. That's L over 4 times 2 is L over 2. And let's see. I think it turns out that just conveniently, the company did that nicely for us, the mass of the stick is about equal to the mass of each block individually, give or take a little bit. So I can pull that out as well. So I get 1 12th plus 1 half times ML squared. I don't need MS, I don't need MB, M will do. What's 1 12th plus 1 half? Huh? Seven twelfths? You like fractions, huh, Len? I actually heard Kyle and Bill say it, so I just stole the answer and heard me. Yeah, six twelfths, uh, one twelfth plus six twelfths is seven twelfths. All right. You give me an estimate of the moment of inertia of the second one. Assuming the mass is about the same, oh, I, I took uh, L to be about 50, when it's really about 45, but that's, that's not, we're just looking for an estimate. So let's just say we're, we're one-fifth of the way in from there. I can move those to nine instead of 
verify that I do it, I'm not cheating. You see that? So you think I'm cheating, don't you? Yeah. All right. So estimate the moment of inertia of the second one. The stick is still there. That's no different. We don't need a subscript on the M anymore. There's still two masses. What this time though is their distance from the axis of rotation. Yeah, about L over 5, just for an L estimate. L over 5, but remember that distance is always squared. So what does that reduce to? 1 12th plus 2 25ths. Just make it 24. Yeah, let's make it 2 24ths or 1 12th. We're just looking for an estimate. Remember, the question was just simply which one's bigger, not exactly what are they. ML squared. So this one's about 2 twelfths ML squared compared to 7 twelfths ML squared, give or take a little bit. But clearly, which one was bigger? Clearly, this one's a lot bigger. In fact, uh, about three and a half times greater moment of inertia for this one. So six people were right. They can take a, a lap around the classroom. Something across that. Okay, we'll make the other ones take a lap around the classroom. There you go. Really? You didn't want to take a lap around and bash yeah. through everybody like you drive? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Batteries are low. Yeah. yeah. Do you get enough chocolate? Yeah. Notice, notice nobody got the extra credit points for bringing me chocolate. That's pretty dumb. That's, that's like a no-brainer. Winter's over, so you can't come clear my sidewalk of snow, my driveway. Fall is over, so you can't come stack my firewood for the season. All that was left was bring me some chocolate for extra credit points. You blew it. All right, what was the next question I had for you about these things? Now that we've established I1 is much greater than I2 by almost four times, what can we do to test it? So yeah, spin them somehow and see what the difference in the torque required. Well, uh, it's pretty easy just to hold them and spin them. You can't tell which is greater or which is less, can you? Who wants to come up and try this and see which one's harder, which one's easier? Glad. <laughs> Is an extra credit. Len, I heard your name. <laughs> Come on, Len. You can stop. You can stop right about here if you don't want to be on camera. This is how it's one time. No, no, you can do it until you feel happy. Just hold it. You got to hold it right at the center. Remember, that's where we were looking at things. Not twirl it. Feel much difference in what it takes. To turn them? Yeah, it's a lot different. Would you say it's 3.5 times different? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Seems about the different thing. Try to go fast. Because remember, alpha is the angular acceleration. Well, that's pretty hard. pretty hard. Yeah. Should we make somebody else try it just to confirm it? Because they'll, so. they'll think mm -hmm, this is just a set up. Yeah, gotta take a rest. John? Oh, all right. Mike? Well, are you worried it'll hurt your wrist? 
Actually, it would probably be better. Probably be good for your wrist. Well, I don't know. It might be, it might not be. It's significantly good. You don't have to come up. Just hold it about the midpoint, right about the 50. And hold it down if you'd like. Down? No, level. Hold it down, hold it oh, level. Like there you go. Oh, yeah, put Andrew's eye out. I don't want to like, take off like a helicopter. <laughs> Big danger of that. You can take more physics. I wish I got to try like that. <laughs> you can come back. Yeah, this is a lot. Yeah? Yeah. Anybody else? Samantha? Give him less. Joey? Joey wants to try it? We have to make, you have to do it like this. <laughs> Ooh, that's hard. That's even harder. Hold it to the center. Isn't that hard? Yeah. All the way up. Yeah. Now do it. That's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, work out really. Yeah. There we go. Hey, yeah. This this could we could have a workout machine here. Kind of like that thing on TV. <laughs> Alright, if, if you want, give those a try. It's easy to set up. Oh, here's another question. Same kind of thing. This is a bonus question. You can write a paragraph about this for extra credit. Answer this question. It's quite easy to balance that. Why is this so much harder. Just a paragraph on that of why that is so much harder to balance. Come try it. You got to figure it has something to do with this business. Same moment of inertia, isn't it? Same object. It is when it starts to fall, and I have to move to prevent that. This is easy. I told you to wear a helmet today. Then I could have gone ahead. Yeah. All right. Write that up. Give it to me tomorrow for five little points of extra credit. A Y. The heavy end up is so much easier. And you can go home, get a broom or something. Brooms are very easy to, to balance when they're the heavy end up. So a couple extra credit points for that. All right. But that was an interlude to help us understand moment of inertia. It really does, uh, is heavily affected by the distribution of the mass in an object. But let's go back now to, to this, our impulse momentum. Our impulse momentum for uh, rotating objects. In the absence of outside forces, outside torques, which are usually caused by forces if there's some moment arm to those forces. In the absence of outside forces, then we could say L before equals L final. L initial equals L final. Does that follow? Oh, sorry, I didn't put in, uh, uh, well, yeah, if that's zero, then that's zero, then before and after are equal. Or I before equals omega, or times omega before equals I after times omega after. If 
the moment of inertia changes, which is pretty easy to do. I'll do it in a second for you as a demonstration. If the moment of inertia changes, then what's got to happen to the angular velocity? It has to be an equal opposite change. It's what? It's got to be an equal opposite change. It's got to change in the opposite direction because we can solve for the ratios of the two and they're uh, in, in effect inverse ratios of each other where the I on the top. Wouldn't that be true? So if I can change the moment of inertia of something that's turning, if I can, let's say, increase the moment of inertia of something that's turning, then the angular velocity will have to go down. Is that true? If I have something spinning and it's a moment of inertia increases, its angular velocity should decrease because they're on opposite sides of the track. So if this gets bigger, this whole thing's got to get bigger, which means that gets smaller. Is that true? Comfortable with that? Well, you've seen this kind of thing happen a thousand times. I have here an ice rink with a figure skater on the ice rink doing um, a single axle. What it, what's a single axle? I have no idea. I can't do one leg <laughs> oh, shoot, shoot, I'm sorry. I have to go get on a sequin leotard first so that I can really, I just, darn it, I don't have time. I'll do that next year when you take this course over again. So uh, what could I do to change my moment of inertia? If I start spinning on that like a uh, ice skater spins, what could I do to change my moment of inertia? Well, pull my arms out, bring my arms in, depending on whether I want my moment of inertia to go up or down. So let's, uh, let's just come up with a, a, a decent model of me as a figure skater, which is a great image on its own right there. We could end class right now and you'd be happy with just that image in your brain for the rest of the day. So. So here's, here's me as a figure skater with my arms out. A little bit of extra mass. Oh, she can't even stay for it. <laughs> See, I'm out of here. So I'm just going just gonna to hold out a little extra mass. I have pretty massive arms, as everybody knows, uh, but not massive enough. I can amplify the effect with that. So there's, there's a model of me, and then I can pull my arms in. Hold the masses in here like that. Will I have a different moment of inertia? Of course I will, because the mass will be distributed differently about an axis of rotation. So let's... Uh, Let's see, let's do the exciting one. This will be the initial, that'll be the final moment of inertia. We'll assume that compared to the masses of my body and the mass I'm holding there, that my arms are, are pretty massless, just because we don't want to belabor the calculation. So let's put a couple, couple numbers to this. This cylinder that makes up my torso, let's say has a radius of about 25 centimeters. Is that about right? Okay. I'm a little bit old. It used to be 25 centimeters. Now it's 30. 
No, no, that's the radius. I mean, that was the diameter. Yeah, 25 is close to being enough. So, let that represent my body as a whole. And my mass uh, will take to be 72. Uh, 72 kilograms. My, my arm length will take to be about three quarters of a meter. Almost exactly. I love that term, almost exactly. There's a lot of power in that one phrase, almost exactly. And these, uh, these are two kilogram masses. So you figure out my moment of inertia with my arms out, and then we'll use pretty much the same radius. We'll, we'll assume I can get those two masses in tight here, and I'll pull them in close enough that it'll be the same radius, so now my mass goes to, we'll say 74, oh so, sorry, 76 kilograms. Because I pulled the two, two kilogram masses into my body. Now what's my moment of inertia? And then we'll see by what factor will my uh, angular speed change. Alright, so you take a second to calculate those moments of inertia. Just an estimate. My height, I'm 6'4". Aren't I, Len? Yep. 20 meters. What? 20 meters? Yeah, I'm 20, or 20 meters. 6'4 or 20 meters. Oh, uh, in, uh, but I have shoes on. So I'm 6'7 or 28 meters. Wow, yeah, wow. Did that help, Joey? Do you need my height? Look at the look at the axis of rotation and which picture is in the table there. Page three eighty two. That's what you can do right there. What do you want? Right there? Like that? Okay. We're doing the same problem, so you should all get approximately the same thing. We're making the same assumptions and estimates, and, and it'll be plenty close enough. goes well, we'll see what I had for lunch. You're going to be glad you're sitting at the back there, Lynn. There's everybody. Come down front so you can see this better. It's more exciting. Alright, everybody know what to do to get an estimate on the moment of inertia? Treat me as a, as a tall cylinder of known radius and mass. Do you need my height? No, not the way, uh, not the, the rotational orientation there on the third picture. That's a flat cylinder rotating, but the height doesn't matter. This is a tall cylinder. Got it? Check with anybody? We should have all, all have about the same same idea here. Treat it as a cylinder with two masses 
stuck out there and then treat it as just a heavier cylinder is, a, is our good estimate. Now go. The sound of the torque is zero. Because I'm just going to be standing up on this spinning and all I'm going to do is pull in my arms. There are no external torques being applied other than getting it started. Do you agree? Can I get the mass? With mass Phil? Masses. With Alan? Did Alan agree masses. with Phil? Can I get the two masses? Would you have, what would you use for the first one? Just one mass. Uh, yes, for the last one. How is this any different than this one, really? Remember how we did that? It's not up there. Did you write it down? Why do you use that? Because that's a thing that we could have symmetric axis. Oh, it's just coincidence. Those two are the same. You know, after the integration, uh, they that just had to have to have the same same moment of inertia as something else. Anybody, anybody agree yet with their calc? Anybody done with their calculations? Don't forget, there's two masses I'm holding out, or will be. Find the, the moments of inertia for each one so that we can find out the ratio, then determine what the, uh, what the speed is. Or at least what the factor of speed increase will be. Because that'll be the ratio of my speeds, F over I. Okay, we have some agreement. Somebody, Andrew? Yeah, no, you're not talking to anybody. Well, don't lie to me. You guys agree? I just said I had to start over because I need to hear something. We have agreement up here. Joey's trying to bridge you. No? All right. I have for the Initial uh, for for this with my arms out. Four point six units. Kilogram meters squared. Kilogram meters squared. 
4.6. The units will cancel top and bottom. So we're just getting a factor of increase. And the unit, uh, the uh, once I pull my arms in, about 2.4, we'll call it 2.3 just to make it easy. About a factor of two. So by simply pulling my arms in, should double my angular speed. Is that what seems like? Is that what you see this, the figure skaters do? That they pull their arms in and they really start spinning? Not in the figure skating? You will be after today. Everybody ready? Joe, Joe, you'll catch me if I start to throw up? You will? I'll let you throw away man. All right. This is going on the camera. A little bit. Was that about twice? Maybe. It looked like even a little bit more, maybe. Because we didn't, remember, we didn't take into account the mass of my arms. Uh oh. Joey, where are you? <laughs> no, don't. There's plenty fast enough, thank you. You'll do it? Cruising. <laughs> okay, that was plenty. Stick out of the way now. Uh oh. Certainly, that was within the ballpark. It was it was markedly faster pulling my arms in. In the absence of when I pulled my arms in, were there any outside torques? Was this true? Yeah, well, there there was. I needed some outside torque to get me going. I had to push off the table or have somebody come up and give me a spin. But I don't trust students to do that anymore. I'm only stupid once. But when I pull my arms in, there's no outside torques. All I'm doing is changing, decreasing my moment of inertia, which increases my angular speed. All right, here's another test. You predict what's going to happen. I've got here a spinning or a, a bicycle wheel I can spin. So I'm going to spin it that way. I'm going to pull down on the side towards me, just because that's the easiest thing to do. And then I'm going to turn it sideways like that. What will happen, if anything? Okay, I'm going to pull it down, turn it sideways. What will happen, if anything? Simple question. Look this. So I'm gonna slow it down. What I'll, I'll, I'll turn it so that uh, from ninety to zero. Yeah, from ninety to zero. But but the the uh, wheel will be going toward me. Will be going across from my left to my right because I'm pulling it down. Then I'll turn it this way so it's going left to right. What'll happen? If anything. Alright, so so here's my friendly cylindrical object that is is the me you so have grown to love. Self portrait. Self portrait. That's my hat. My junk cap I'm wearing. All right, we got a couple seconds to come up with what what's happening, and then as I look at you, I'll have this wheel that is rotating that way, and then we'll rotate this way. 
where that's the side closer to me as it is that side closer to me. What will happen, if anything? Why are spinning on that? No. You ready? Got an idea? Only, only I guess, three possibilities. Well, let's let's just do it and see what happens. All right, I spin it, I turn it sideways, nothing happened. Who bet nothing would happen? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say I'd be standing on that? I guess I didn't. I'll you. So I'm going to stand on this, spin it, and then turn it sideways. You balance the meter stick on your chin while you No, this is going to be plenty, thank you. What will happen, if anything? Let's see. Uh, when I do that, is there any outside torque being applied to the system? The system being me and the wheel. When I do that, is there any outside torque applied to the system? Is there to the wheel as a system by itself? Yeah, of course there is. There's me pushing up on one end, pulling down on the other, so it turns over sideways. But for the system as a whole, for me and the wheel, there's no outside torque. Therefore, what should be true? If the sum of the torques is zero, then what's true? Then the angular momentum should be conserved. Delta L equals zero. So, the before momentum, sh angular momentum, should equal the after angular momentum. All those three things just fall right from each other. Those two things fall from the first. So let's see. Here's, here's me to start with. That's, that's the wheel in a vertical plane spinning. What's my angular momentum? What's the angular momentum of the system? Well, I, I have to be a little more specific because this platform can only spin in one way. So what's my angular momentum about the axis through that platform uh, axis? Standing here. What's my angular momentum right now? Zero. About an axis that goes down all the way through me through the, the platform here. Zero. 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 There's nothing spinning around that axis at that time. So there isn't any angular momentum about that axis. Next, I will let it spin that way, where farthest away from me is uh, going across from my left to my right, which gives us a an omega in that direction of the wheel. Once I turn it sideways, what must my angular momentum be? Zero. I have zero angular momentum here. I turn it sideways now, what must my angular momentum be? Must be zero. There's no outside torque. I'm, I'm, all this turning of the thing I'm doing is inside the system. There's no external torque being applied. So if all of a sudden there's some angular momentum in one direction, what will I have to do as a system? Spin the other way. Spin the other way. 
so that the total angular momentum is still zero. So if the wheel has the mo angular momentum that way, I'm as a system, I'm going to have to get some angular momentum that way to counteract it. If the wheel's going to spin this way, I'm going to have to spin this way. I'm so not if I sure. I'll turn it the way I did it, the wheel, wheel's now spinning this way, I'm going to have to spin the other way, so the total angular momentum is zero. The angular momentum of the wheel one way, the angular momentum of me the other. Is that what we think is going to happen? That's what the physics says. So if I turn it this way, that's just what happens. Look at the precise control <laughs> I have. It's pretty amazing, actually. This is much more pleasant to do than the other one was. And it works either way. This is much more fun to do. Now the wheel's starting to slow down. <laughs> Pretty cool. Did just what did just what we thought it said. The angular momentum was conserved. Whatever angular momentum I added in one direction had to be taken away. Some other uh, some other angular momentum such that the total was still zero. Even though I was turning one way, the wheel was spinning the other so that the total angular momentum was zero, which is what it was when it started. Now, there's angular momentum sideways. Is that conserved? Because the wheel starts with angular momentum. We use our right-hand rule. It's turning that way. We have angular momentum in that direction. Is angular momentum conserved sideways? How come when I turn it, I don't also start flipping head over heels? Which would be awesome. Because it's uh, not perpendicular. That wheel is spinning fast enough to put it upright and throw you over. Well, remember, angular momentum is conserved in the absence of outside torques. There's friction between my feet and the platform to prevent me from twisting up and head over heels. I can feel like, oh I, oh, I just felt it. That's why I don't actually do this with ice skates. But if we were in outer space and I did this, there would be three-dimensional conservation of angular momentum. First thing, when I do this in outer space, I'd start spinning the other way automatically because I just added angular momentum in that direction. And then when I turn it, I didn't have angular momentum in that direction, I'd start turning the other way. No, I'd start turning the same. I forget. It. That's why I won't go to space. That's great. I love that, those demonstrations. All right, conservation of angular momentum. Alan. Um, you were holding, holding the wheel out away from me when you turned it sideways. If that wheel was... That's because I used to catch my beard in it. <laughs> if, you, if that wheel was even further out, would it actually work like the way torque does? Where you could, if you had more friction on that, you just put that wheel further away and fight against the friction of the better by yeah. yeah. But it's it's hard to do it with any appreciable difference. Because I have to hold it a certain way away to keep my chin hairs and chest hairs from getting cat out caught in it. And I just can't I don't have very much latitude in that way. But yes, you're right. 
it would. Uh, that would be a good question for dynamics next year. It's beyond this course. All right. Um, tomorrow's lab. Let me introduce it now because several people have to leave early. Um, can, can stay the three hours. Can have to be done in two. So I need you to be finished in two. Tomorrow, what we're going to do is a. Uh, 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 a torque problem where there is an applied torque and we have to use that to determine what uh, what the moment of inertia is. We're going we're gonna to apply some known forces, figure out what the angular acceleration is, use that to figure out what the moment of inertia is. In the lab, you'll see across the front wall and across the back wall near the top some gray disks. It's actually a gray disk and a little black disk on it. And I need you to figure out the angular, the, the, sorry, the moment of inertia of those. Your object will be to find I of those two disks together. Now, I'll tell you what the mass are. You can measure the radius. You could calculate that as a good estimate. But I also want you to measure it. Here's how you're going to do it. We're going to hang a known mass from the inside of the, uh, from the, from the edge of the smaller disk. We'll call that R1. We'll let the bigger disk be R2 if we need it. <coughs> going to let that drop from rest. So you're going to have it set up just like this and then let it drop from rest. When it does so, the mass will start to accelerate down and the disc will start to accelerate, have angular acceleration as, as the mass falls. So if we look at just the disk, and by the disk I mean the two disks together as a system. Is there any torque being applied to that disk? Of course there is. And it's pretty easy to figure out what that is. If you know what the tension in the line was. If you knew what T was, you could very easily, easily figure out what the torque is. If we knew what the angular acceleration was, then we could calculate what I is. Anybody have any idea what the tension in the line is? Let's see. There's the mass. It's got some weight to it, as all mass on Earth does. And it's attached to the very same string. So it's got T. Is T equal to W? No? No, not just the mass is falling. <laughs> the mass is... It has to be more than just falling. It's, it's accelerating. The mass is accelerating. So you, you had the right track there. Just a, a one word short, Tyler. Uh, because of that, the weight doesn't equal the tension in the line. We need the tension in the line to figure out what the torque is. Torque equals R1 times T. How could we figure out what the acceleration is? Because if we can figure out what the acceleration is, and we know what the weight is, we can figure out what the tension is. If we know what the tension is, we can figure out what the torque is. So how could we figure out what the acceleration is? Sorry? Proportional. 
example, what's proportional to what? The accelerant. Alan? I was saying, I mean, you could use the circumference of the, you know, of the disc, but I was saying that it, it, it totally depends on the friction of the wheel, right? Well, we're getting to that. Hang on. What if we did this? By the way, how awesome are these colors? These are my Easter colors. They're great, aren't they? What if we let it fall a known distance and we time that fall? Can we figure out the acceleration from that? If we assume it's constant acceleration, we sure can. Three things you know, the distance traveled, the time it takes, and <coughs> what's the third thing you know for a constant acceleration problem? Initial velocity is zero. So we can figure out the acceleration. That will lead to the tension. The tension will lead to the torque. Once we have torque, let's see what the deal is. The sum of the torques equals I alpha. How do we find the angular acceleration? It's the same acceleration times the radius. Yeah, the, the fact that uh, the wheel or the, the mass is slipping. So that's uh, R, sorry, um, A equals R1 alpha. So we can, if we've got this acceleration of the falling mass, we've got the angular acceleration of the disk. What torques are being applied to that disc? Because it's the sum of the torques that causes that acceleration. What torques are being applied? Well, there's this one right here. Any others? Alan, you said there were a second ago. Yep. Friction, where? In the bearing. Those discs don't spin forever. Sooner or later they slow down because there's friction in the bearing. So that's a torque in the opposite direction. I'll call that tau sub b for the bearing torque. We'll call this tau sub a for the applied torque. So the sum of the torques is tau a minus tau b, the bearing torque, equals I alpha. Alpha, we're going to know from here. Because we're going to figure out the acceleration. Once we figure out the acceleration, we know the angular acceleration. So that will come directly from our measurements and a few calculational steps. We can let the spreadsheet do it. Once we know the acceleration, we can figure out the tension. The, uh, the tension line, that gives us the torque. So we can change this around a little bit. That's just rewriting it algebraically. Because here's what we're going to do. We'll run this. That will give you an A. That will give you an alpha. So this is the independent variable. Because we can control that. We can change the masses. We could. Uh, uh, there are a couple little things we can do. Once we determine what A and alpha uh, A is, we'll know what the tension is. Once we know what the tension is, 
that will set the torque being applied. That makes this the dependent variable. Because the other two things are constant. The moment of inertia doesn't change and the bearing torque doesn't change. You've seen an equation that has the form dependent variable equals constant times independent variable plus constant. That's y equals mx plus b. So you'll control the independent variable by simply picking different masses and rerunning the test. Once you've picked a different mass and give a particular acceleration, that'll give you a particular applied torque. And when you graph those, you should get a straight line with a intercept that's the bearing torque. It'll look something like this. The bearing torque is going to be very small, so you're going to have to be careful tomorrow. Good, straight, simple measurements. You'll be, you'll come up with some very good numbers. And the slope of that line is going to be the moment of inertia of the disk system. Which you can compare to your estimates because we'll know the mass of those disks and the radius and you just figure out what their uh, moment of inertia is that way. So you can compare those two. Alright, so uh, I'll review that real quick tomorrow, but that's the bulk of it. So if you think about it a little bit tonight, you won't be screwed up tomorrow. Uh, yeah, you will. Can't wait to grade your homework, Andrew. Oh, you already left. I have a great time this one.